Okay. Hey everyone, welcome to Ask Concussion Doc, episode 43. Um, yesterday or the day before or something, two days ago. Anyway, we put out on uh, our Instagram channel um, and also Facebook. I can't remember. Facebook, we put out uh, questions that you guys have uh, for podcast topics. Um, kind of went dry on topics, I guess, so we're looking for you guys for, for input on that. And so we received a ton of really good um, potential topics, and so we've now put that into a list. But if any of you guys listening out there want to hear different topics or something that we haven't yet answered and, and you really want us to, um, be sure to send it in to us. Also, some of the topics we received were stuff we'd already covered in previous episodes, so if, there, um, if there's something you want to have uh, answered, make sure you go back to the previous episodes and take a listen to those to see if uh, the question has already been addressed. Um, you know, that being said, things change, and so if, if there's new information on a particular topic, we'd be happy to address it again with that updated information. So the topic that we have chosen to pick for today's podcast is how to improve your visual systems post-concussion. This is a very common question and obviously the uh, visual disturbances following concussion are prevalent. A lot of you out there with concussion symptoms will know this, that your visual system feels off, things feel blurry, things feel um, you know, kind of weird. Uh, visually, you might feel off balance, you might have trouble reading, you might have trouble concentrating, uh, you might have light sensitivities. Uh, there's a whole host of potential visual problems that people might have. So obviously a really good one to address. I want to start off with saying I am not an optometrist, I'm not an ophthalmologist, I'm not an eye care professional in any way. A lot of the patients that have ocular motor dysfunctions or any type of visual abnormalities following concussion, I will refer and co-manage that with an optometrist, uh, vision therapist, or depending on the severity, it might need a referral to the hospital or an ophthalmologist. But um, I'm gonna also share with you some websites uh, or information in the show notes of places you can go to look for to find a vision therapist. Uh, in Canada, we have a group called COVTR. They are um, um, vision therapy-based optometrists. And then also in the United States, there's a group called NORA, uh, Neuro Optometric Rehabilitation Association, I believe. Uh, they're a fairly large organization. They have people all over the place. And so if you're looking for um, some help and you're in, in North America anyway, Canada, you can look at COVTR. Uh, the US, you can look at NORA. Uh, we'll put those websites in our show notes uh, on the podcast so that you guys can refer back to them. Okay. First off, let's talk about some common visual problems. Well, first off, we have the serious vision problems that we have to address immediately. The things to be looking for are something like a detached retina, orbital fractures or bleeding into the eye. Um, there's a whole host of things that could happen um, that would be, you know, more serious and require kind of an urgent referral. Um, but those are thankfully quite rare. Um, particularly in helmeted sports where you're not getting stuff going into the eye directly. Um, boxing, MMA, that type of thing, you might see this uh, type of injury. The most common problems following concussion though are usually around ocular motor function, meaning how your eyes move and how they work together, meaning, meaning the vergence or how they, um, you know, how both eyes will kind of move in opposite directions to be able to maintain focus on a particular target. Um, so this can be issues with smooth pursuit. So if I bring this pen across back and forth or, or on my eyes, this is testing my smooth pursuit. It's how smooth my eyes can focus on this. Your eyes should have a nice smooth fluid motion as they move across. What you'll see with concussion patients is they'll have this saccadic motion where as I bring it across, their eyes will be jerky. So at different time points, or they'll full on lose me in a particular visual field. So if I'm gonna do a visual test on somebody and I'm moving my finger back and forth like this, what I'm looking at is their eyeballs and whether or not they're staying smooth or whether or not there's jerkiness to their visual motion. And if there is, they'll usually report onset of symptoms. They'll usually say that makes me feel weird, it makes me feel dizzy when I do that, um, or a whole host of other things. These people typically have issues with reading because as they're reading a sentence on a page, their eyes are skipping all over the page and they have trouble having a smooth eye motion so that by the time they finish a sentence, they don't really comprehend what they just read because they may have missed a few words. Um, you know, it, and, and you know, it can create or look like various cognitive problems. So that's smooth pursuits. There's also saccades, which is how well your eyes can 
lock on to a target and then unlock from that target and then lock on to a different target. And um, this requires a few complex kind of things to have happen, but one of the tests for it is just looking side to side back and forth. And what the clinician is looking for to see is how fast your eyes can get there, how fast they can unlock from that target, and when they move to the new target, are they overshooting the target, undershooting the target, and do they have to continuously rearrange their eye motion to eventually lock onto the target. You should be able to move your eyes from one target to another in one to two eye motions without and being able to lock onto it. And you should be able to do that in a fairly quick sequence. Now we can test horizontal saccades, we can test vertical saccades. So that's one issue. The other one is vergence issues. So um, as I bring a, an object closer to my, to my face, I can have convergence of my eyes. Some people have a convergence insufficiency where they start having double vision way out here. Um, that's a convergence insufficiency. And you need both your eyes to come together and that's your depth perception. So if I'm trying to read, both my eyes need to come together on one word. If my eyes aren't able to come together, it'll look double to me and I won't be able to converge on that. So I'll have to, you know, I'll have trouble reading and things like that. A lot of people with concussion have convergence insufficiencies. Convergence insufficiency is also present in between 10 to 30% of healthy people. So even healthy people might have it. It might not be purely concussion related. So you have to keep that in mind as well. There's also visual motion sensitivity. So a lot of movement around people, uh, riding in cars, riding on a train, uh, going to a shopping mall, or walking up and down the aisle at a grocery store, people might feel overwhelmed or there's too much information coming in um, visually. So it's, it's visual motion sensitivity is what's that, what that is called. I'm gonna talk about that one more in depth as we get down the list. Light sensitivity, very common. We don't necessarily know what causes light sensitivity. There's a few theories. One of the theories, at least in the acute phase, is that um, your um, light coming into your eyes creates stimulation of the brain. And if your brain is, is in a low energy state, that hyperactivation or that hyperstimulation can cause an onset or increase in symptoms. There's also been some more recent research that looks at um, the thalamus in the brain, which is kind of the sensory integration component of your brain, having a hyperactivity uh, following concussion. So that might be why. You might have a hyperactive thalamus, which means that's why you feel light sensitive. In terms of treatment for that, that one's a little bit more complex, and so I'll get down to that at the bottom as well. Um, dizziness, gaze stability. People might feel as though when they're walking that everything is moving up and down as if they're looking through a lens of a camera and everything's moving up and down. The way that your brain and your eyes and everything else are set up is that if I'm looking at a target and I turn my head side to side, I should be able to maintain my gaze on that target. So as I'm walking and my body's moving up and down, my eyes should be able to kind of be floating and maintain their position on that. If they can't do that, my eyes will move up and down with my body and I'll feel like I'm looking through a camera. Now, that is, you know, could be a vestibular problem as well. Um, but that's one thing that people will describe is, is this issue with their vestibular ocular reflex and their ability to hold and maintain their gaze on a fixed target while walking. Next point to make, visual problems are not necessarily visual problems. So even though you feel like it's in your eyes or you're not able to focus on something and you feel that it's an ocular motor problem, it may be, but it also may not be. Because the way that your brain works is that it integrates input from a number of systems to help things function properly. So stuff that might look like a visual problem also requires input of the vestibular system. So if there's a vestibular problem, sometimes your eyes can flicker because of that and it makes you feel dizzy and off and you can't focus or you can't zero in on a particular target, that might be a vestibular issue. Um, I had a patient yesterday uh, who came in complaining of dizziness. Initially when we were, we were talking, I thought, you know, this is likely to be kind of a neck related issue, but he also described some symptoms that could be representative of BPPV, which is a, is a vestibular um, um, vertigo type of thing. And when I put him in the position to test for BPV, his eyes just started going nuts, like haywire nuts, moving all over the place. And he had to grab onto the table and he was screaming, believing that he was flipping backwards, right? Because that's the sensation that he was getting. But his eyes were going all over the place because the input of your eyes and your eye motion is heavily influenced by your vestibular system. So what you think might be a problem with your eyes might be actually a problem with your vestibular system. So it's important to take a look at that as well. 
it could also be input from your proprioceptive systems. So your proprioceptive systems are the muscles, are the sensors in the muscles and joints uh, throughout your body, right? The easiest, the thing that I always say to my patients is like, I don't have to look at my arm to know that my arm is straight out and extended. Why? Because the sensors in my skin cells, the sensors in my joints, the sensors in my muscles tell me the position that my arm is in. Same if I bend it, if I straighten it, I know where I am in space because that's all, all that input is from my proprioceptive system. The highest density of proprioceptive fibers are in your digits, in your fingers, to be able to be very dexterous and move very you know, well to grab things and what, what not. The next highest is in your neck. And your neck tells your brain a lot about where you are in space. So as your eyes move to the right, the muscles that are designed to also turn your head to the right engage in preparation to go that direction because the way that we're set up biologically from a safety perspective is that if there's a predator, there's a tiger to my right, I'm going to look and turn at the same time. So everything in your body is set up to go that direction. Now all of these things, so your visual system, your vestibular system, and your proprioceptive system from your neck go through your cerebellum and that's what integrates the coordination of movement. So if somebody has a cerebellar issue and they try to reach for something, they will not be able to do it because the integration of their eyes to see the target and the sensors of their muscles are telling their cerebellum different things and it ends up in this jerky movement. You don't have a nice smooth movement. The same thing can happen through your eyes. So if your head is like this, and your eyes are level, and your ears are level, and the signal going through your cerebellum is that, yep, we're level, and your neck has some tension in certain areas, some damage to some of the muscles, and the sensors are giving abnormal input, well now, you know, your, your cerebellum is getting the signal that your neck is heavily tilted to the left, let's say, or heavily rotated to the left. And all of a sudden, that change in, in, in interpretation coming in, so you have your, your cerebellum goes, wait a minute, the eyes are saying this, the ears are saying this, but the neck is saying something different. I don't know who to believe. And you get that feeling of, oh, wow, that feels weird. And I, I will get this from patients all the time. I'm driving, I'm driving, I'm driving. Car, you know, I want to change lanes. I go to shoulder check and all of a sudden, whoa, I get this split second dizziness where I just feel off. To me, that is usually what turns out to be a neck issue, even though they feel it visually or they feel it like it's a balance problem. It, it is technically a balance problem, but it's actually input from the neck because the proprioceptive system in the muscles and joints of your neck are, are the abnormal signal that you're getting. As soon as you fix that, the signals are all the same. And once the signals are the same, people feel good. They don't feel dizzy when they turn to the right or turn to the left. They don't, they feel their eyes are able to move. Cause if you think about even smooth pursuits, your eyes are moving across a page. Well, as your eyes are moving across a page, like I said, the muscles, in your neck that are supposed to turn your head in that direction, they're engaging. You don't feel it, but they're actually engaging, ready to go, so that you can turn that direction. Well, if there's abnormalities there and things aren't sitting right, and those muscles are getting abnormal input because their sensors are either stretched or they're damaged or whatever, as your eyes move, that's what can create some of that skipping. So even though you might be doing vision therapy and you're, you know, you're doing thumb tracking and you're going, you're seeing a vision therapist and they're doing all this work with your eyes and you've been going for six months and you're not really seeing that benefit. That's because there could be something underlying that issue that hasn't been addressed, like an issue with your neck, like an issue with your vestibular system. So the thing with concussion is we have to look at this from a global approach. We tend to segment things in healthcare. You know, if I'm a knee specialist, I just focus on the knee, but most knee problems are from the hip or from the ankle. And that's where the whole thing falls apart. So if I'm a vision therapist, I'm gonna focus on the vision, but the problem might be in the vestibular or the neck. And, and so it's the kind of that thing where we have to work together in a kind of a multidisciplinary fashion in order to be able to get the best picture for this. Um, so if you are receiving vision therapy and you're kind of getting to that point where you're like, I'm not really getting better here, you know, what's going on? there's probably something underlying that no matter how much therapy you do, if the signals are mixed and crossed because something else is out of whack, you're never going to get to the point where you feel like you've had that, that difference has been made. So here's some basic things that you can do, particularly for um, visual motion sensitivity and also for light sensitivity. Cause the person who asked this question was most concerned with 
you know, crowds and motion and also with light sensitivity. So I figured we would answer those. If people are interested in this or you have other concepts that you're, you know, you're interested in, just send us a message and we can put it into kind of the, the schedule of potential upcoming podcast topics. Um, I don't want to get into like a full vision lecture here. Um, you know, it's not even my expertise, but I know some basics. So visual motion sensitivity, the big thing with concussion right now is exposure therapy. So it's, it's called habituation and adaptation. If you have an issue that creates an increase in symptoms for you, the idea then is to challenge that system until you're able to go through normal life without having those symptoms. So the way that I explain this to people is consider it to be getting yourself in shape. You know, when I first, and God, I hate leg day, but when I do legs, okay, the first time I do legs, if it's been a while, I'm like, all right, I need to do some legs. I'll go in and I'll squat and I'll leave the gym like a zombie with my legs straight, like a Frankenstein with my legs straight and sore and painful, and I won't be able to walk right for three full days. Then the next week I come back and I do it again, and all of a sudden I'm less sore. It doesn't bother me as much. And then the third week I do it and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm sore. Okay, now I need to up my weight. I need to challenge myself more because I'm not, you know, it's not as challenging for me anymore. And, I, and then you continue to do that. And so this is the same thing, right? If something makes you feel dizzy, makes you feel off, and let's say it's visual motion sensitivity or large crowds, what you should be doing is putting yourself in scenarios where you're in a large crowd. At first, you might only be able to tolerate for five minutes. That's okay, just make sure you have an exit plan. I go into the mall, I walk around, okay, I'm feeling weird, okay, I need to leave. You go back out to the parking lot, you sit in your car, you let things calm down. Once you're feeling better, you go back in. Okay, now I can get to maybe 10 minutes. And you keep doing that until you're able to tolerate it. So it's the same scenario. When you first do it, it's gonna feel overwhelming. But if you react by pulling back, similar to me, if I say, oh, when I do legs, my legs get sore, I'm not gonna do legs anymore. Do you think my legs are gonna get stronger? No, and it's the same concept. If I'm gonna pull back and say, well, when I go in crowds, I get dizzy and I feel off and I don't like that, so I'm gonna respond by not doing it anymore. Well, you can't live your life like that. There's crowds everywhere and that's not how you wanna live your life. And so unfortunately, you gotta put in a little bit of hard work and put yourself in scenarios that make you feel uncomfortable. Like any growth mindset, you have to do things that make you feel uncomfortable and this is no different. So exposure therapy, habituation, adaptation. If crowds make you dizzy, throw yourself into crowds. Do it incrementally and do it and, and just keep gradually increasing it so that when it's not bothering you as much anymore. Um, the next thing is binasal occlusion. This is more of a band-aid than an actual treatment solution. But what binasal occlusion is, is you take a pair of glasses. We just decided this topic this morning so I don't have any props with me. I didn't bring my binasal occlusion glasses from my clinic. but Basically what they are is if you take uh, glasses and pop the lenses out of them or even keep the lenses in, but then you put tape on the inner part that covers kind of the middle, you know, one fifth or, or you know, maybe one quarter of the, uh, of the lens on the inside. Um, that actually helps with people that have this visual motion sensitivity. And the theory on that is the way that you're, you know what we need to do? Sorry, I'm getting off here. I'm talking to Sam. You know what we need to do is we need to do that like a whiteboard drawing and I'll explain, I'll explain visual and peripheral and visual motion sensitivity uh, with binasal occlusion and how that works. Perfect. Okay. Coming soon. Coming soon. Stay tuned. But anyway, quickly verbally to explain it because I know that people are listening and they can't really get it. Um, basically, the way your eyeballs are set up is that everything is crossed through your retina, so uh, things that are on the on the left side of your vision are actually being seen by the right aspect of both each of your eyeballs. And same thing, anything on your right field of vision is actually seen by the left side of both of your eyeballs. So there's this crossover effect, it's just the way that light comes through and you know uh, hits our, our retina. Uh, binasal occlusion, what it does is it cuts off that one of those signals. So if something's off to my right, and my left eye 
uh, is blocked here from being able to see it, I now only get one copy of that light information hitting my eye versus having two copies if I'm getting a copy from each eye. So that just reduces the stimulation and people often will feel a lot better in a crowded environment when they have a binasal occlusion situation going on. I'll draw the picture, we'll do the whole explanation and we'll do it in a separate video. Um, and of course, visual motion sensitivity. Also, I would want to rule out vestibular and neck issues because oftentimes that is there as well. The other thing that can play a big factor in this is anxiety. So if you feel that going into a crowded environment or you know being at a concert or something is going to make you feel bad, well, even before you go, the anxiety of what might happen starts to build and then all of a sudden it becomes chaotic, right? So even things like that is the anxiety of the situation before you put yourself into it can impact how you're actually gonna respond to that challenge. So keep that in mind, know that it's possible. Um, Next up, light sensitivity. Again, there's a few theories on why this is, but one of the things you should not be doing, which I see all the time, is people just staying in a dark room. That used to be the old school mentality of it, let's just stay in darkness, but what that does is it actually creates light sensitivity. If you've ever been to a matinee movie or if you've been downstairs watching TV on a Saturday afternoon and then you come upstairs to where it's brighter, all of a sudden you're like, oh my God. Right? It feels like somebody has thrown sand in your eyes. But it's just because you've been in darkness. So the way that your eyes do is your eyes will adjust to darkness. Right? You ever notice that when you dim all the lights down, things seem, seem really dark at first and all of a sudden you get used to it and you can see everything really clearly? That's kind of your night vision kicking in. If you were to flick on those lights right away, all of a sudden, boom, that's, that's intense for everyone, concussion or not. So staying in darkness and you come out into a light environment, people start to believe that they still have light sensitivity, but it's actually just the fact that they've been sitting in darkness for three weeks, and now they're exposing themselves to light. The other thing, don't wear sunglasses indoors. Okay, if you're outside and it's a sunny day, of course, wear your sunglasses, that's eye protection. But inside, you do not need to wear your sunglasses. Get used to the ambient light that's there. Sometimes it might be just a, uh, um, one of the wavelengths of light. Sometimes blue light can bother people. Sometimes it's other wavelengths of light. So you might need glasses with a special tint in it to try and filter out some of that, you know, some of those, that, that UV spectrum of light, but um, you don't want to have um, just straight blocking of light because that will just create light sensitivity. And actually there's been studies done on this that have found that people that wear sunglasses um, after their concussion are way more likely to end up with photosensitivity, light sensitivity after a year uh, following their concussion. So try to avoid it as best as you can. And again, it's almost like exposure, right? Get used to regular light. Uh, look for certain filters because certain light might be um, um, more impactful than others. Also, there's blue light filters on your phone, so you can actually change your phone. I know that when I hit a certain time of day, my phone has a blue light filter coming on, so all blue light is filtered off my phone because that's helpful for sleep and the production of melatonin. Um, also on your computer screen, I think you can do this with some newer models of computer. You can shut that blue light down. There's also things you can do like, um, you know, little blinds that go on, on a computer screen. There's, um, there's technology you can get. Uh, Iris Technologies is one that comes to mind, but it's basically an e-paper screen, so it doesn't have that LED backlight. And this is, these are all just band-aid solutions, right? We don't really know what the what a treatment for light sensitivity is we know how to have these little things that can help us feel more comfortable with it but don't go into the darkness and don't wear just sunglasses because that's not a solution that actually perpetuates and makes the problem worse so um next thing last last piece of advice on light sensitivity is just move on with your life okay i find that a lot of people with light sensitivity they will they will look to light like there's there's lights in here there's a huge light right there right and to see if people are light sensitive, oftentimes they will look right at the light. Like I'll have a patient in my office and we have these UV lights over top of our clinic too. It's this big kind of training facility. Um, and I'll ask a patient, oh, are you, you know, light sensitivity? And then before they answer the question, they'll look directly at the light and be like, yeah, oh yeah, that's bright. Nobody looks directly at the light, okay? So just try to go on, live your life, and don't be looking for symptoms. If you're constantly looking for symptoms, you can continue to find them, right? If I believe that I'm light sensitive and to test myself, I keep looking at lights and they look bright to me, 
I'm going to think that I'm light sensitive. Meanwhile, I'm not light sensitive. It's just the fact that we're not meant to look directly at the light. Don't look directly at the sun. Don't look directly at the light. And just try to move on with your life and not let it, you know, hinder you um, at least as much as you're able to. You can find solutions that are helpful, but just avoid wearing sunglasses and going into darkness and try to put yourself into uh, kind of exposure environments, obviously, that are you know, still safe for your eyes. Don't be going outside in like really bright days and not wearing sunglasses. I'm just saying inside, try to get used to regular ambient light. Okay. Any questions come in on anything? There's a few, yeah. Okay, cool. So I'm going to switch over to concussion doc. Um, anyone who wants to flip over can do that. There's a few questions over there. And uh, for those of you that are listening, um, you can't do that. But if you want to join us, we're going live on Instagram every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Cool. All right, guys. Cheers. See you next week.